Good morning, Dr. Brad Anold. Yes. Yes, I'm calling regarding um, well some stories here that have been put online regarding the uh, starfish disease, um, the wasting disease. Yes. Uh, could you tell me a little bit more ab about this disease or what you've heard about it so far? Uh, well, it's uh, <coughs> widespread California to Alaska, um, perhaps south of California. I don't know. Um, We've seen examples of it uh, for the last maybe 10 years or so, but very low levels. In the last two or three years, uh, it's become quite common. Um, the Barkley Sound experienced it in really quite badly this year for the first time, um, whereas uh, places like uh, Oregon, Washington, um, the Salish Sea have uh, experienced it uh, Early, early, beginning last year, really, in uh, high numbers. Uh, there's been a lot of work done on it. Um, it uh, is clearly a pathogen. The people that have been doing the work uh, the, are going to publish a paper on it very soon. I know the paper's in review. I've not seen an advanced copy. Um, it seems to be associated with high temperatures. So I think one of the reasons Barkley Sound was uh, spared for a long time was the uh, Low tides in the morning coupled with uh, fog meant that the temperatures didn't get very high, and so uh, this didn't go on very quickly. It's affected uh, mostly the bivalve eaters, at least uh, uh, the bivalve eaters have been most badly affected. How's that? Um, so things like uh, the sun star and uh, evasterius and uh, the ochre star, so disaster, um, have all been affected. Um, but some of the other ones, which don't seem to be, uh, that aren't as, uh, that don't eat bivalves in quite the same way, um, seem to actually be responding and taking over the spots that used to be full of sun stars and ochre stars, which is interesting. Um, is this the same, at, uh, is this what occurred in past? Uh, um epidemics of this this disease? Or? Well, it, it, the etiology of the disease, the development of the disease looks the same, um, but I can't honestly say whether it's the same or not. Part of the reason for that is, is that uh, having not identified the pathogen and we don't have samples, so it's, you know, it's not possible to go back and forth um, and to be absolutely certain. And of course, as these things start to die, there's all these opportunistic infections that happen, so it becomes quite complicated. Um, ideally, in this situation, what you'd want to do is to meet what are known as Cox postulates, which would be to isolate the disease organism and then um, put it back into healthy animals and cause the disease. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any cell lines for sea stars, so it's not possible to isolate uh, these kinds of pathogens and keep them alive, keep the pathogens alive in a cell line in order to reinfect. So it's going to be a little bit more indirect. Um, but I, I, I have a lot of respect for the people that are doing the work, so if they feel they've got a, got this thing nailed down, then I'm pretty confident they do. Do you have any idea if they, um, well, if they tested for radiation, possibly Fukushima radiation affecting them? Well, there's lots of people have been measuring the radiation up and down the coast. Uh, there's a big group um, headed by Jay Cullen at the University of Victoria in collaboration with Woods Hole and a number of other institutions, as well as a whole pile of citizen scientists and American organizations like NOAA. Yeah, but it, they're only testing the water. Do you know if there's anyone actually testing any of these bivalves and anything like that? Because that's where, uh, you know, from my point of view, that's where the real testing should be taking. They'll be the first ones to accumulate this, and so will the fish as they, they eat these smaller uh, prey. Uh, I know that they, that at the same time as they've been collecting water samples, that there have been biological samples taken, and there's no evidence of any accumulation. Is there evidence of Fukushima radiation in any of these uh, marine life, kelp, whatever you're testing, whatever they're testing, I should say? No, there was... Within a week of the Fukushima radiation uh, event, there was uh, some aerosol radiation detected. Um, the Simon Fraser University lab uh, did that, but they have equipment that is so sensitive that they were able to detect it. Um, the values are, I, I don't remember the exact numbers, but you could look it up, um, were minuscule. And then since then, we haven't been able to detect it. And we haven't, we haven't yet received any 
any radiation, um, as far as I know, um, in conversations with Jay Cullen. Are you aware that the... Fukushima. Sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off there. Are you aware that the Sydney airport uh, had picked up uh, back when this first went off in April 2011, uh, iodine 300 times above the um, U.S., uh, uh, I think it was the drinking water level? No, I don't recall that. Um, so besides that, uh, we only have the ocean water that's being tested here by the university and a couple of other groups, so there's no one actually testing any of the um, marine life on the shoreline. Uh, no, I think they are actually collecting biological samples and testing those as well. I'm, I'm quite certain they are. Uh, NOAA, for example, in, uh, in Washington State, I know is taking samples. Do you know of any other independent uh, researchers that may be doing this type of testing? Um, uh, independent means what? Uh, not related to the government, no government funding, just on their own. Uh, well, I mean, pretty much everybody would have to have some government funding because this equipment is so expensive. We're talking millions of dollars to well, do properly. A uh, gamma spectrometer can be as low as 15000 Yeah, but we're talking about something that with much higher sensitivity than that. Possibly. Something, something that can detect it in the femtomole um, levels. I see. Um, we don't necessarily, I, I think, have to go that, that that far down. I don't think it necessarily has to be, uh, you know, pick it up in minute amounts. I think it's more about identifying the isotope itself, right? Um, I think as this Fukushima, if, if it continues, uh, if they don't get a cap on it, uh, eventually we may end up with higher levels, possibly. But nonetheless, at this point here, we haven't found any evidence with uh, any Fukushima radiation in any of this marine life. None that I am aware of, and I've spoken to quite a few of the people involved. And the starfish disease has definitely occurred uh, way before the whole Fukushima event ever, ever took place. We believe so, yes. Uh, on multiple occasions? You set up... Uh, uh, yeah, multiple years. At least 10 years before, also on one occasion, I think you mentioned? Yes. Well, 10 years ago from now, so yeah. Um, another question is the, uh, this uh, white uh, plume sea anemone. And the fact that they um, grow on pilings and not necessarily on the rocks on Bamfield, I heard a little story about that. I was wondering if you could clarify that whole situation for me. Well, I mean, this is a subtitle organism. We see it, because I'm not a diver, but we see it primarily on pilings and chains and so forth. Uh, it's common subtitly um, in some locations. Um, yeah. Um, what can I say? I mean, we've got videos on our site of, you know, our divers, um, our YouTube channel, our divers having been down and videoed, and I believe there's some in there as well. Uh, underwater photographer um, from Campbell River has a number of photographs. Underwater photographer from uh, Kelowan in Barkley Sound has a pile of photographs. I mean, they're yeah. they're, they're everywhere. Well, actually, what I was referring to was a, a certain person making a claim that uh, these uh, white uh, sea plume anemones were actually covered all over the shores along the BC coastline up until Fukushima. Now they're all disappeared, which I... Well, they're never above the tide line um, because they're too big. Uh, they just collapse. Yeah. That's so that's, I mean, there are lots of sea anemones in uh, intertidally and in uh, tide pools and so forth, but not typically the white ones. So the different species live at different places in the ocean, is that not correct? That's what happens, yep. So you can't just go to a tide pool and expect to find all different vari varieties of uh, sea anemones, correct? Yeah, ab absolutely. That's why, you know, different things live in different places. That's why we have so many different species. So if someone's to make, to do a scientific uh, uh, study of the ocean, you would have to be more than just sitting on the boat taking pictures. Is that not correct? Would you not have to go down there and take samples and go underwater? Well, you would want to do your sampling um, fairly systematically. And, and does sampling include, like, or is it just taking pictures, or do you need to do more than that? Well, uh, taking pictures works uh, under some circumstances, uh, but you have to be a bit careful how you do it. No, I mean, for example, let's say the, the, the death of the starfish. If, if I took pictures of the starfish and a bunch of them dying, could I come to the conclusion that it's Fukushima? Uh, well, that would be making one of those leaps in logic that leave people breathless. <laughs> 
Okay, so you definitely have to t collect the sample and you got to have it analyzed and you have to make sure that it's Fukushima radiation or a certain amount of level, uh, something related to r radiation that killed it off, right? Well, you know, normally when you've got a phenomenon like this, what you have are a number of alternative hypotheses and what you try to do is eliminate the ones that, uh, all of them until, you know, having tried to eliminate one many times, you become convinced that that's what it is. So if it's Fukushima radiation, you should be able to measure the radiation. There shouldn't be pathogens. There, You wouldn't expect it to be clumped. You wouldn't expect, there's a whole pile of things that you could predict um, under a variety of different scenarios, and that's what you would do. And one of those scenarios, would that not be the fact that since Chernobyl, uh, sorry, not Chernobyl, since Fukushima is right on the shores of Japan, and we've had um, several stories here coming out, I've been making stories on this, how they've picked up high levels of radiation in some of the seafood there near Fukushima. So if we were going to see a certain die-off because of high levels of radiation, would we not see it first primarily in Japan along their coastline? Uh, you mean die off of uh, sea stars in Japan. Correct, like any type of, uh, you know, because we that, have... That's a good prediction. I'd, that'd be interesting to see what uh, what that looks like in terms of... I, mean, I understand that um, radiation is being measured in seafood in Japan, and it appears to come from Fukushima, but I'd be interested to see what the mortality rates associated with it are. And, and that's always been my claim, that if you're going to say that uh, it's coming over to the West Coast and killing everything, then first you better pick it up in the, in the fish and start proving that it's there first and, and picking up some of the bivalves and proving it they're, they're sucking it up also and then go look over Japan and pull out a bunch of stories of dead fish and yet we're not finding those stories yet. No, and you'd expect it to follow the currents which you know go up the coast of Japan, across Russia and down the from Alaska, that would be the direction you'd expect it to come based on the current patterns. That's correct, and I think that's part of the reason why we've some uh, some of the stories here have come out where the tuna had picked up some of the Fukushima radiation as well as the certain types of salmon that uh, uh, travel the uh, Pacific coast. Uh, yeah, that um, I can see that as a possibility that you might, in for instance, salmon that are in the Pacific gyre. Um, if for part of their life, and then coming back here, they might be transporting it or Things like tuna, which travel very long distances, might pick up a little bit. Yeah. Interesting. Well, That's an interesting thought. Yeah, well, I made a story here. They tagged one uh, bluefin uh, tuna for 300 days, and it had traveled over 300, uh, sorry, 24,000 miles in uh, 300 days. And he had gone back and forth across the Pacific Ocean two and a half times in that time period. Yep, I, I believe that. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much for uh, answering all these questions, and I um, hope uh, you do keep doing some good work there on the West Coast and uh, keep us uh, in tune with what's going on, and um, I'm glad uh, someone's keeping an eye on the ocean scientifically. <laughs> well, there's lots of people out there working, that's for sure. Okay, have a nice day. Okay, ciao. Oh, bye. Bye now. Okay, folks. I had to call him because, um, well, I don't know if you've been seeing what's been going on here, but uh, Beautiful Girl by Dana just uploaded another video, and while well, again, they're st trying to steal my Fukushima day here to try and get amongst my videos. Fat chance of that, but if you go read at the bottom here, and I'm going to share with you an email that someone, was sent, that someone sent to me, because it turns out Dana has got himself a whole bunch of accounts and has been in trouble with the law in the past. So as I mentioned, this whole tour is nothing about, take, it's just about taking pictures, that's all. And as you heard the doctor himself, that if you're going to do scientific work, you've got to be taking samples, you've got to prove your point. So, you know, taking pictures of an area where you've never been and saying, you know, they're all missing, absolute joke. So this is the email. And the person said they've gone out and checked these uh, YouTube accounts and turned uh, turns out they, they all belong to... Dana Dunford. So it turns out Dana has had a hard time here with the police and um, he got violent here. He was violent. I, I couldn't dig up the full story but apparently he had trouble at the Port Hardy Hospital. And may have pushed a nurse around. We know he broke a window as he was heading out of the hospital and I guess the RCMP was sent after him and they may have roughed him up I guess when he was trying to be arrested and well he went out on a personal vendetta against the RCMP and he got himself all these different YouTube accounts. So we have a very sick puppy here, folks, and I just want you to keep an eye out for another person. This guy here has come out here. He's you making videos. Fake 
Stay away um, from him. Mr. John Smith of Vancouver Island, Canada, connecting dots. Okay, stay away and don't click on any other videos that they're making against me, okay? There's a, uh, a big attack on my uh, credibility here. Don't put up with that stuff. If you want to follow me, that's great. If you, if you want to research me, that's great, but stay away from their links.